Welcome everybody to our weekly Bible study. It's good to have you with us. This week we're going to start Exodus, uh, the Exodus story. And if you have your Bibles with, uh, with you, <laughs> then turn to Genesis chapter 50, verse 22. So to begin the book of Exodus, we're going to start by taking a look at a, a couple of passages in Genesis and then a number of a number of things in Genesis in order to set the stage. So again, if you have your Bible with you, go to Genesis chapter 50. And we'll start in verse 22. <clears throat> Genesis 50, 22. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation, and the children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought up on Joseph's knees. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And so, at the end of Genesis, we realize that we've gone from everything in the creation being very good in Genesis chapter 1, 31. Now here in Genesis 50, we find Joseph dead in a coffin in Egypt. And if the reader were given just these two sections, he would know that something dreadful happened. Something dreadful must have happened sometime in between. And indeed it had. The cherub given charge over Eden had rebelled. He had deceived Eve. He had caused her to, and he caused her to transgress God's command. Adam and his wife Eve sinned in eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and sin entered the world. Um, Romans 5.12, whereas by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And so death had passed from Adam now to Joseph. And we know that in the meantime, God had called Abram out of his land and promised him the land of Canaan. And his grandson Jacob bore the twelve patriarchs of the tribe of Israel. These were the brethren Joseph was just talking to in Genesis 50. Actually, to be more precise, it would have been the children and the grandchildren of Joseph's eleven brothers that he was talking to that he had just entreated to take his bones up out of Egypt. He asked him to take his bones up out of Egypt at a time in the future, Joseph prophesied that God would visit them. So the book of Exodus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. And we will be told later that the prophecy was fulfilled after a sojourning by Israel of 430 years. We'll see that in Exodus chapter 12. If you want to go there, you can jump ahead real quick. To Exodus chapter 12 and verse 40, where we learn about the sojourning of Israel. Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 40. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel, who dwelt in Egypt, was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So we'll read that in... Uh, Exodus chapter 12, when we get there. And, and that verse, by the way, is often quoted in conjunction with Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3.17, the Apostle Paul writes, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, the law, the Apostle Paul writes, And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul. Paul was referring to Abraham being uh, credited with righteousness for his belief. 
But there's the 430 years again. This figure of 430 years has been a point of some contention among both biblical scholars and, of course, secular skeptics. <clears throat> because no matter how one tries to do the math, there's simply no way that the children of Israel could have been in Egypt for 430 years. And many, many of the modern English translations state quite plainly that Israel lived in Egypt for 430 years. The ESV states the time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. The NIV, now the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. The NASB, now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And so the skeptics have called this an error. And of course, then they say that all 66 books of the Bible have to be at the very least suspect. But typically, the skeptic recommends that the whole Bible needs to be thrown out because we found this error. And they tell us, throw it all out in favor of what they suggest we worship, which typically involves them to some degree. Throw the whole thing out and worship me. They'll say worship yourself, but what they're really saying is worship me. Trust me. And so, is there an error here? Well, the modern, in the modern English translations, uh, there must be an error somewhere. Okay, because the timetable given in the same text previously from, from Kohath's arrival, or from, from Kohath to Amram to Moses, the timeline given just previously in the text from Kohath to Moses is at most 350 years. And so unless there's an error there, it's not possible that Israel dwelt in Egypt for more than 350 years. So there, there's an error somewhere in the Bible right here. So to find out how to reconcile this error, or this apparent error, let's first look at the biblical chronology of Israel's history and the rest of the biblical record um, regarding this sojourn. Because if there's an actual error or an actual contradiction recorded in the text, then an error of this magnitude, then I would tend to agree with the skeptic that it would at very least put the rest of the historical record of this book in question. And that would certainly bear on the integrity of the theological assertions that are made in the book as well. So let's examine the entirety of the biblical chronology to this point. So we all know, in the beginning God created everything in the year zero. And we can see then that the biblical chronology until the flood is recorded by genealogy to have been about 1,700 years. So remember, the Bible is primarily a historical narrative written by God to tell us the truth of what actually happened and the truth about how we are expected to live. Um, now, God's not responsible to us or to any man to account for every moment in time. But for the sake of His own name, He has given us an accurate record to go by. Now, this genealogy in Genesis that we're going to go through here in just a second, it adds up to 1,650, 1656 years, 1,656 years. But it only counts by years, not days and months. It doesn't say he was 700 years, 4 months, and 4 days old. It doesn't get that precise. And so, it could be as much as 1,674 years. And then there's the additional Canaan that's listed in Luke 3.36. There's a genealogy in Luke that lists an extra Canaan. In, in all the modern translations. And that Canaan's not in Genesis, this Genesis genealogy, who, um, if that's not a scribal error, which I contend that it very likely is a scribal error, that could add possibly another 40 years or so at the most. 
to the chronological record as recorded year by year in Genesis. So at most, that would make the time between creation and the flood somewhere between 1,656 years and 1,714 years. Or like I said, about 1,700 years. If I had to guess, if I had to make my guess at exactly the day the flood occurred from creation, I would guess it was precisely 1,666 years. That would be my guess. But that's just a guess. We'll have to ask the Lord when we actually get there. Because he wasn't that precise. And he's, so the author, which is God, he's not uptight about skeptics accusing him of not being precise enough. Because no matter how they slice it, they can't fit millions or billions of years into this chronology anywhere. I mean, without just making stuff up, which they did, and they do. And he knew they would do that anyway. So what would have been the point of being precise? Because he knows they're just going to make stuff up, the people who want to rebel against him. So would there have been a point to God recording to down to... Because he could have recorded it down to the, uh, the year the month, the day, the minute, and the second, if he wanted to. But would that have helped the skeptic to believe? I don't think so. Now, there are some places where God does precisely make prophecies and precisely record time, but typically that's for our benefit and, and for his own glory. God's not obligated any further to the skeptic than he already has obligated himself. The heavens declare the glory of God, and He is readily identified by the things that are made. And God seems to have left just enough vagary in the text so that those who don't want to believe and who want to find fault, they can if they want to. If that's the way you're going at the text, you'll be able to find plenty of that. God left plenty of room for that. You want to go to hell? Go to hell. Unfortunately, it's, it's, just that, it's just that matter of fact. But the record in the Bible is true. And the, 400 year, the 430 years, by the way, is a specific prophecy that appears to disagree with a specific genealogy. And so, in my opinion, the question about this 430 years needs to be answered. And one of the wonderful things about studying things out in the Bible is that most often in pursuit of understanding one thing or trying to solve one question or puzzle, you'll discover other things and then you'll understand them even better. And so I'm going to include these charts in the, the brief that I post on the website so that you can look at them. They are... I credit Answers in Genesis, our good friends at Answers in Genesis, for providing these awesome charts. But as I said, in the year zero, God created everything, Genesis 1 and 2. And then at 130 years old, Adam became the father of Seth. That puts us at the year 130. Seth then became the father of Enosh at 105. Enosh became the father of Canaan at 90. Canaan became the father of Mahalalel at 70. Mahalalel became the father of Jared at 65. Jared became the father of Enoch at 162 years old. Enoch became the father of Methuselah at 65 years old. Methuselah became the father of Lamech at 187. Lamech became the father of Noah at 182. And notice, by the way, you remember Adam lived 900 years, right? We remember that from Genesis. Does anybody remember exactly how many years Adam lived off the top of your head? 930? Or was it 900? Um, 930, right? Adam lived 930. 930 years Adam lived. So Adam lived through this entire lineage up until Noah's father. Up until Noah's father, Adam was still alive. I just hadn't really thought about that. 
But that's pretty amazing that eight generations after the creation, people were still able to talk to Adam before he died. Um, Adam died just one generation before Noah, about 132 years before Noah was born. Now, the flood started when Noah was 600 years old. So when you add up the dates that these fathers bore their sons, it adds up to 1,656 years. It could be between 9 and 18 years more than that, depending on how many months or days. Or I would guess 1,666 years. If I, had to, if I was a betting man and I had to bet on what the Lord will tell us when we get there, He'll say it was 1,666 years. But we'll wait and find out when we get up there. So, the flood starts at around 1666, and it lasts for about a year. In fact, now the flood is one of those events that God recorded the time almost to the day. Because the flood started... In the 600 years of Noah's life, God says on the second month of the 17th day of the month, the fountains of the great deep were broken up in Genesis 7:11, And then it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, right? Rain fell for 40 days and it covered the earth until the third month, the 27th day of the month. And then the water rose to its highest level sometime between the 40 days of rain and the 150 days. Um, in fact, if we go to Genesis 7, 24, if you have your Bibles with you, go to Genesis chapter 7, and starting in, in verse 24. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days, right? And so at some point between... The 40 days of rain and 150 days, the water reached their highest level. And then on the 10th month, in Genesis 8, 5, we learn on the 10th month, the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. The water had stabilized, and it was starting to recede. 11th month, 11th day of the month, in Genesis 8, 6, that's after 40 more days, Noah sends out a raven. Then in the 11th month, on the 18th day, seven days later, uh, Noah, Noah sends out a dove, Genesis 8, 6. And then on the 11th month, the 25th day of the month, seven days later, Noah sends out the dove again, and it returned then with the olive leaf, remember? And then, 17, and then seven days later, 12th month, second day of the month, Noah sends out the dove and it doesn't come back. This is in the 601st year of Noah's life, the first month, the first day of the month. That's when Noah removed the cover of the ark on the first day of the first month. The surface of the earth was dried up, and Noah could verify that the earth was dry to the extent as far as he could see. And then on the second, that was the first day of the first month. Then on the second month, the 27th day of the month, 56 days later, the earth was dry, and God commanded Noah's family to come out of the ark. So that is precisely 370 days and if you want depending on how you count the first day as a whole day or the last day as a whole day if you count them both as a half a day it could be as much as 371 days it's a pretty specific and accurate account of exactly how long the flood uh, occurred on the earth and then after the flood according to the biblical chronology uh, Abram well, obviously Noah's kids had kids. Shem, two years after the flood, he fathered Arphaxad. Arphaxad at 35 fathered Selah. Selah at 30 fathered Eber. Eber, by the way, is who the Hebrews are named after, Eber. Eber at the age of 34 fathered Peleg, the time in which the world was divided. Peleg at 30 years old fathered Ru. Ru at 32 fathered fathered Serug. Serug at 30 fathered Nahor. Nahor at 29 years old fathered Terah. And Terah at 130 years old fathered Abram. And then Abram was 75 years old when God called him out of Haran, out of Ur of the Chaldees to, to go and dwell in the promised land. So 
Abraham's calling just puts us at about the year 2084 after creation. Give or take a decade or so as we keep the calendar. The year about 2084. Looking back from the birth of Christ in 4 BC, that will put us at the year 2088 BC. Now how it could be that Jesus Christ was born four years before Christ, that, and he certainly was, by the way, according to the reckoning of our modern Gregorian calendar, Jesus Christ was born four years before Christ. Now how that is, that's a whole other interesting bit of biblical detective work, and that'll be for another study at another time. But the point that I'm making with this presentation of genealogies and chronology is that despite what you may have been heard, the Bible presents a fairly tight timeline from the creation right up through the Exodus. And frankly, all the way through to the Apostle Paul and John writing the Revelation on the island of Patmos. In fact, it's... Uh, it's all somewhat less than 4,000 years to get from the creation to pick one, the Apostle Paul or, or, or John writing Revelation. It's all somewhere less than 4,000 years. And we're at somewhere less than 6,000 years right now. There's not really enough room reasonably. I mean, you can just make stuff up and make assumptions and say that it's maybe 7,000 or 8,000 or 9 or maybe less than 10. But... A reasonable reading of the text would say that we're somewhere less than 6,000 years right now. In fact, the, uh, the modern Hebrew calendar puts us at the year 5,783 since creation, in the year of our Lord, 2023. So 5783 in the year of our Lord, 2023. And that's close enough for me. I would assume that the Jews have kept pretty good track, and they're probably pretty accurate. So... So now, let's do our best to calculate how long the sojourn referred to in Exodus 12.40 was. I'll just quote it again. Now, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. That's the King James, by the way. Well, 25 years passed from the time Abraham arrived in Canaan at the age of 75 until the birth of Isaac. Right? Right? at which time Abraham was 100 years old. You remember, Isaac was born when Abraham was 100 years old. So that's 25 years after he entered into Canaan, after he came out of Ur of the Chaldees. Sixty years then passed from the birth of Isaac until the birth of Jacob. And then 130 years passed from the birth of Jacob until he and his descendants moved into Egypt, as we learn in Genesis 47.9. So that's 215 years that Abraham spent in Canaan, before he went down into Egypt. Now, the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch both include a reference in the Exodus 12.40 text to dwelling in Egypt and Canaan for 430 years. The Septuagint says they dwelt in Egypt and Canaan, and the Samaritan Pentateuch says they dwelt in Canaan and Egypt. So opposite, for 430 years. And the sum of the figures in the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch from Abraham's arrival in Canaan and his going down with his family into Egypt equals 215 years. And so this leaves another, 250, uh, another 215 years for the actual stay in Egypt. And that number fits with the genealogy from Kohath to Amram to Moses that's recorded in, in Exodus 6 making the entire sojourn in Canaan and Egypt 430 years. So, Egypt dwelt, I'm sorry, Israel dwelt in Egypt for about 250, 215 years. And they weren't enslaved there the entire time because we just read, Joseph lived long enough to see his son Ephraim's children to the third generation. And we know that Israel wasn't enslaved. We'll learn as we begin our study in Exodus that Israel wasn't enslaved until another king arose who did not respect the memory of Joseph. So, what I've just presented is my outline of how I'm convinced that there is no error 
there was no error in the original text. God did not write a genealogy from Kohath to Moses and then say there was a time frame that couldn't fit. God did not do that. The original author did not make an error. There is not an error in the original intent of the text. So, the Bible is reliable. It's just that people who copy the Bible and, and men who, they make mistakes. And God's not a magician guarding us against every mistake that can be made magically. So, men make mistakes, but also men do evil. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Now, some connect these passages to another supposed error in the Bible. The 400-year period mentioned in Genesis 15, 13 to 14, during which Abraham's children will be strangers in a land not their own until their eventual deliverance. Uh, Genesis 15, 13 says, And God said to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and they shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And so the skeptic says, See, it says 430 over there. Here it says 400. This guy who wrote the Bible... He's not reliable. Well, two points about this. The 400-year period of Abraham's descendants sojourning and subjugation began when Isaac was born. Since it was Ishmael who oppressed Isaac the day he was weaned, remember. And even in Canaan, Isaac and Jacob were regarded as sojourners. They were strangers in a land that did not officially belong to them yet. That's point one. Point two, in order to account for the discrepancy between Exodus 12, 40, that refers to 430 years of sojourning, and Genesis 15, 13, that speaks of 400 years, we can see that God relayed the prophecy concerning the 400 years to Abraham 30 years before Isaac's birth at the, at the confirmation of God's covenant. The, what the Jews call the covenant of the two pieces, when God passed in between the animal that had been divided and confirmed his covenant while Abraham slept, by the way. And, 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 and one more point on the 430 years. The King James Bible does not state explicitly that Israel was enslaved for 430 years or 400 years in Egypt. It does not say specifically that they lived in Egypt for 400 years. In fact, as best I can tell, it was only Cecil B. DeMille who quoted that in the movie, The Ten Commandments, because he was obviously not a biblical scholar. But that's like, that's going back to 1956 now. That's a long time ago. So that, this idea of 400 years of slavery in Egypt has been in the popular consciousness for 70 years, almost. And Cecil B. DeMille, maybe he didn't do it on purpose, but it sure seems to have stuck. And Hollywood's a pretty evil place. So I would suggest don't look to movies, any movies, to be your guidance for what the Bible says or what's true. Just be careful. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but now, you can see there are some people out there making some good videos where they actually quote the Bible. And I like that. I like a video that someone makes where you can actually check every verse. You can pause it and check them out. And so there's a good video on what I've just gone over um, on YouTube about the 430 years. And I'll post a link to it. But back to the, the King James. So the King James says this, quote, in Exodus 12, 40, quote, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. So the King James says the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. It doesn't say they lived in Egypt for 430 years. Now you remember all the modern translations that I quoted earlier. They all said specifically that Israel lived in Egypt for 430 years. The King James and I believe the New King James as well, they're not that specific. They're more true to the original text, I think. Um, so once again, the translation that I've found to be the most reliable, most often, is the King James. And I know the language is a bit cumbersome and that we don't talk like that anymore anymore. 
And how are the modern people going to hear you, Doug, if you're using all this archaic language? Aren't you limiting your ability to reach people by not speaking to them in words and language that they can easily understand? And my answer to that is, yeah, maybe I might be. And that's fine. Because let me make a, a couple of points. Because first off, number one, I'm not King James only. I'm just King James first. And I've only come to that conclusion in the past year or so since I've been studying the Bible on my own for two or three years. I've just, more, more often than not, that turns out to be the better translation. And it's not because I believe it's a perfect translation, supernaturally transmitted and supernaturally preserved by God. It's just the least corrupted, I think. And in my opinion, it's worth having to work your way through some archaic language to avoid the modern corruptions that I would argue a lot of the modern corruptions in the text are more effective at confusing people, especially at confusing the lost who are actually seeking or at least, and, and, and especially empowering those who would mislead the lost who are seeking. The modern corruptions are better at all of that than the these and the thous and the archaic language and some of the more embarrassing phraseology that, that you might find in the King James if you're, if you're not mature enough to simply work your way through that and explain it. It's, um, the controversy of the 430 years that we're talking about right now, it wasn't a controversy before the modern translations. Because before the modern translations, the English Bible didn't state that the children of Israel lived in Egypt for 430 years. That corruption, um, not, and that only came in with the newer translations. And that corruption not only can be a source of pushback for the unbeliever, that corruption, along with countless other corruptions that have crept in, are more significantly impediments to believers trusting that the Bible is a reliable historic account to be taken literally. The historical narrative of the Bible is to be taken literally. And these corruptions that, that have worked their way into the text... They work their way into the seminary, and the seminary student is eventually taught, well, you can't really trust the Bible as a pure historical record. This is a, a philosophical document. It's a spiritual. Anyway, th that's what these corruptions have done. And, and when the believers are suddenly convinced over time that the Bible's an unreliable historical record, it's much, much easier to convince them of all manner of fables and lies, which is where the vast majority of the church is today. They're off into fables and lies. And anyone who thinks the modern seminary and the modern pulpit is more effective for the gospel than they were back when everyone had to work their way through the these and the thous, well, I would say that you're demonstrably incorrect. Demonstrably incorrect. And so, to finish on the 430 years, so, can I guarantee you that I'm precisely, mathematically, chronologically, perfectly correct to the day of how I reckon that this so-called error is not an issue? I cannot. But God says in Exodus 12 that it was 430 years to the day. And I believe Him. And I'll ask. Must we reckon the record of every year in the Bible precisely in order to preach the gospel and in order to know that the Bible is true and in order to be able to trust the historical narrative of the Bible? Do we need to know it down to the, to the year? If we need to know it down to the year, then what about the month? Then what about the week? Then what about the day? Then what about the minute, the hour, the second? Is that what we need to know? That's, we don't need to know all that. And where there are apparent discrepancies that we cannot reconcile with 100% certainty, we should do our best to find the answer and know that God will reveal who was right and who was wrong. And someone will be right and someone will be wrong and He will be right in the end. And some of us will have been right upon occasion. Some of us will have been wrong upon occasion. And by the time we get up there and ask Him about it, 
we probably won't care that much about it. We at least won't take so much offense like we do here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when the secular scholar approaches the text, he tells us that he does it with no presupposition, meaning he does not assume that the text is inspired by God. That's, he's, he's a scholar, you see. And because he doesn't presuppose that it's the inspired Word of God, that implies that he's in a better position to give a dispassionate and unbiased analysis of textual differences and conflicts and errors and disagreements, and that believers, Bible thumpers, fundamentalists, you should look to the secular scholar in order to keep yourselves from error. But, of course, the secular scholar and the modern textual critic, they are, in fact, approaching the Bible with a presupposition. They presuppose that it was not the inspired Word of God, at least in the case of the secular scholar. And is not, is not that a presupposition the same as mine, just to the contrary? My presupposition, by the way, that it is the inspired Word of God my presupposition causes me to view apparent errors and conflicts as a problem of interpretation to be solved in the interest of knowing God and knowing the truth. Their opposite presupposition leads them and those they influence in the exact opposite direction. So I admit my bias. I believe that the Bible is the Word of God. If there is an apparent error, I assume that the author is God and that God did not make the error. Either I assume that either I'm not understanding it um, and I need to study further and seek input from other believers, or that some man along the way made an error in the transcription, in the translation. That's what I assume. It's not that there's an actual error in the text. I don't assume that. I, I assume there's no errors in the original text. The academic, he claims no bias, except that he doesn't view the Bible as the Word of God. And so, I mean, it's up to you to decide which supposition to ascribe to. The academics condemn me for my bias. Well, I condemn them for theirs. But I admit mine up front. And, and ask yourself this question, by the way. Based on what we know of Satan, who is the adversary, the accuser, he's the enemy. Based on what we know about him and the men that he inspires over the millennia, that he's exercised influence over the hearts and the minds of people, is it likely or unlikely that Satan and his minions would seek to influence the transcription, the translation, and even the teaching of the Bible. What do you think? Do you think he would want to influence that? Would Satan and his minions seek to establish influence in the institutions in charge of those things? From the monasteries to the universities and even to the church. Is it possible that Satan would want to have influence in the church, over the Bible, over the teaching? I would say he would. He's a diabolical and evil enemy. And remember what Paul said, by the way. And I'm just going to paraphrase Paul. We'll start in Acts 20 with Paul. He says, After my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, beguiling you of your reward, intruding into those things which they have not seen, vain, vainly puffed up by their fleshly mind. That, that's, a, that's a paraphrase of three different warnings from Acts through Ephesians 4 through Colossians 2. And Paul goes on to warn us, Teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. You notice what he says there? Endless genealogies. 
The skeptic and the scholar want to point to the genealogies and what they allege about them, and they never want to come to a conclusion about them. We look at the genealogies in order to come to a conclusion about them. Paul warns us in 1 Timothy, um, he encourages us, I'm sorry. He says, the end of the commandment is charity, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. And so I would contend that my presupposition that the Bible is the Word of God and that it is true, my presupposition accords with this instruction from Paul. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Anyone who presupposes the Bible to be the Word of God will be in accordance with Paul's encouragement there. But Paul, again, he warns us about those of the opposite presupposition. 1 Timothy 4, Paul says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And Paul goes on in 1 Timothy 6, If any man teaches otherwise... And consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereby comes envy and strife, railings and evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself." And I would contend that the secular presupposition accords with this. Given to envy and strife and railings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, supposing that gain is godliness. Remember, Paul warned us about those who serve their own belly by leading people in circles, forever questioning, but never coming to an understanding of the truth. Be be careful of that. And finally, Paul warns us one more time, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. That's from Romans 16, where we just read last week. So Paul warned Timothy that in the latter times, Those thought to be brothers would depart from the faith, going instead after seducing spirits and what Paul calls the doctrines of devils. And Paul gave that warning to Timothy almost 2,000 years ago. So to think that the corruptions that Paul was warning about then are not by now actually embedded in the history of the institutions that rule the world. To think that those corruptions are not now embedded in the very fiber and, and, and being of those institutions would be naive. And to think that those corrupting forces have not set their sights on the Bible itself would be naive. And so I encourage everyone, whatever translation you use, to be diligent and seek out two or three witnesses for everything that seems out of order in the text. Anything that seems out of order, seek out two or three witnesses in the text. Seek out two or three different translations. Seek out two or three different uh, uh, commentaries. Seek out the input from two or three other brothers in the Lord who you trust, who you know know the Bible. And go into the text knowing, confident, that the author himself is inerrant and that his word is perfect and that you are like me. You are merely amateur Bible students. That's what we all are. We're amateur Bible students. And if you profess yourself to be a professor of this book, I would be very careful because I'm just an amateur. And I don't want to be called a professor and to be held to that kind of standard. 
Um, I need the help of different texts and different commentaries and different men. But I know that the author is perfect and that his word is perfect. And I'm convinced all of us will be mere amateurs until our teacher actually reveals all things to us. Remember, Paul said, we see through a glass darkly. So no matter how much we study on this earth, no matter how many degrees we have, and no matter how much effort we put into it, we, we see through a glass darkly. And so we won't know, the, the full truth won't be revealed until we see him face to face. But we can be confident in what we have, that it's true, and that we can be reasonable, and that we can put forth the effort to elucidate how we can tell that the author of this book is the living God himself. And we will, we will look more into that as we go through um, Exodus. And so we start our study in Exodus, and we get to Genesis 50, 26 is how far we made it. We haven't even made it through the first verse in Exodus, but we will as uh, time goes by. And so let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the book of Genesis and all the historical books of the Bible. We thank you that you wrote down for us a historical narrative that tells us the truth of who you are and who you expect us to be, um, not with a list of rules, but with a, a narrative of interesting and compelling stories and characters. We're so thankful that you did that, Lord. We thank you for this time to study it and look forward to more. Whether it's here or whether it's there with you, we know that we'll be studying your word forever and learning more about you and we just love you and thank you for everything that you've done for us and everything you've given us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.